All right, folks, I got a big one for you this time. This is Akshay. Akshay, how do you say your last name? Nanavati. 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 Akshay Nanavati is attempting to be the first man, the first, to cross Antarctica by foot. Is that right, Akshay? Yep. Cross Antarctica, dragging a 400-pound sled for 1,700 miles, 110 days, completely alone, solo for the entire time. And you'll be you'll be obviously documenting this, recording it. Will it be live on social media platforms? I, mean, I don't even know if you get any kind of Wi-Fi down there. I don't know if you can do this. No, fair question. There is not. I won't be not, like, I will be, we are creating a documentary around it, but when I'm out there, I'll do it alone. The documentary crew is filmed on all my previous expeditions, but out there I'll be alone and just kind of documenting it as best as possible with the GoPro, kind of doing video journals as I descend into madness after 110 days alone out there. Uh, and and have you even been? Have you have you surveyed the land? I mean, do you know what Antarctica looks like? I mean, how does it? I mean, I thought that was like uninhabitable. I thought there was nobody there. I mean, there have you is been there before. I have. I was in Antarctica two years ago on a previous expedition. Sky, we, me, and my team became one of only twenty six human beings to ski up a very remote glacier up there called the Axel Heiberg. We skied up the glacier, got to the plateau. And after 17 days off expedition, I got frostbite and lost two fingers. So show that again. Show that again. Looks like you're flipping off my audience. But (laughs) there we go. (laughs) Yeah, this is it. Lost the tips of two of these fingers, the left middle right ring finger. Yeah. So they, I mean, they were black. This actually kind of gnarly story. This one was black and had to go the right ring finger. It was like, I mean, it was dead. It was just a hard black finger. This one, the left middle finger, it actually recovered fully. But the thing is, once you get frostbite, you're for the rest of your life, that that portion is always going to be more prone to frostbite. So when I was in the Arctic last year, I was on a series of training expeditions in northern Norway, uh, way north of the Arctic Circle. This finger would get cold faster than the rest of my fingers. So I made the decision to actually preemptively just cut off the tip. So it's a because because it's a because to me it's a liability. So when I went to I had to get the surgery done in India because no doctor here like even in India the doctor was like we're not going to cut this off. This is like a good finger. We can't ethically cut this off. But the thing that helped convince him, my family's from India, so my mom was there, and my mom said I need you to cut off my son's finger because to me it was a liability. Like imagine I'm. 50 days into Antarctica, 60 days into Antarctica, and this finger gets frostbite and I lose the expedition. That's not, right. that's not a price I'm worth, you know, worth your, your family, your family backs you in this. They, they, they worry, but they support me. They do. They understand the journey. They understand the spirituality of it. They obviously worry at how intense it is, what it's, you know, the dangers, the concerns, uh, but they're, but they're supportive, very supportive. John, you know, Jump in anytime you want, but are are you are you telling me like how long are you expecting to do this expedition? How long is this going to take? One hundred and ten days. You know that for sure, or are you just guesstimating? That's the highest that I can take. I mean, if it takes less time, awesome. If by you know if I can pull it off in ninety five days, hundred days, because let's say I'm covering way more distance than I thought, fantastic. But the highest, like I'll be taking one hundred and ten days worth of food with me in the sled. So it cannot take any more than that. If for some reason, like let's say I just can't pull off the distance, then they can come evacuate me from wherever wherever I was. Okay, so you're gonna have an emergency backup. You're gonna be able to call somebody to come and get you immediately if you're in trouble. There's only two portions. Most of the most of the journey, there there's a they they can evacuate you now. Obviously, it's weather dependent. So if there's gnarly storms, which there are in Antarctica, nobody's coming then. But you can kind of ride it out in your tent, like we did last year. I mean, two years ago when I got evacuated. But uh, there's only two sections of the gla- uh, of the journey where I'm on a glacier that nobody can land there because of crevasses. So other than that, though, evacuation is possible. I do have a question, uh, Nino. Sure. Um, I, I also I want to say I appreciate you having me on this to to interview. Uh, with you because this is a subject that is really uh, just really interesting to me I mean one of the most interesting places in the world it is Um, so my question to you is why like why in the world are you risking your life to go all hike all the way across Antarctica and how how are you going to be able to carry that much food because I I believe there was a guy named Colin Mm O'Grady who uh, is at least given the title of the first man to cross Antarctica, which he didn't actually cross it. I was looking at his path and it looks like he goes to the South pole 
and then back like kind of like a V across the ice shelf there. Um, but he had to carry three or 400 pounds of food, travel 20 miles a day, and it took him 54 days to do this. So yeah. why and yeah. how, man? Uh, it's just, so yeah, it's let just... me let me address the whole thing about Colin O'Brady the last bit and then get into a little bit about the dangers and then the why. Um, but so Colin O'Brady, as you said, he did not actually cross Antarctica. He traversed the landmass. There is a map uh, you can like I, I can actually show you at some point. You can see his route versus a full coast to coast crossing. If you Google Eric Phillips, um, uh, Eric Phillips, uh, so Antarctica solo map, he has done a great job creating a, a map of all the uh, Antarctica solo map. He created like a map of all the crossings of Antarctica. So you can see on there very clearly how he did not actually so yeah there's a uh go to images and then crossing yeah the solo traverses and that top left one there you will see you'll see the ek so yeah there you can see the green route is colin o'brady's that was it's not a crossing of antarctica it's a traverse of a landmass so that's one distinction mine is an actual coast to coast crossing so mine will be similar to the red line but not like a little bit different. I'll be ending uh, at a different spot than the red line is Borge Ausland. He is the greatest living oh, explorer. I see, I see the red the the red line going like this down and then here. Where, where and an actual here, like, mine will go. Mine will go. So mine will start at that top exactly where your arrow is. Go to the South Pole, and then come straight down to that kind of island there uh, at the bottom of the of the coast. So kind of there yeah. exactly right there. So, so, but that is go a pop, so you're going to do a V. It is a V, but it's a coast to coast, meaning it's starting at the edge and ending at the edge. So why don't you just go bing? You to do a full crossing, you have to go to the South Pole, and there's also a bunch of mountain ranges in there. So in the Trans Antarctic Mountains is there. So to do a full crossing, it has to actually go through the South Pole. So then you're, you're going to go bing and then bing. Yes. Why don't you go bing? Make it all the way down this. That would be <laughs> so even I mean, to to do that without so the, the lines that you see that have across people have crossed Antarctica, but they're using a wind support. So like a kite to propel them faster. Nobody has ever crossed it without a kite or without dogs. So That's you're doing it do. on foot this entire on year. Foot, like, he's pure man hauling. So that means dragging all my weight. So as you can see, the green route, that's what Colin O'Brady did. He did what's called a land traverse. And you see the second half of the route that's got white white kind of dots on yes. it? Yes, yes. That, what he used, what's basically a paved highway, essentially. There's there's tracks that they pave a, a, a path, and there's flags every 400 feet or so, so you don't have to navigate, and you ski on essentially what amounts to a very flat, smooth terrain. I will not be using that, because that's not an unsupported journey. I will not be using a paved highway, which he did. And the third thing that was distinct between my route and his is that the distance he covered has actually been covered multiple times by different adventurers. So it was not, quote unquote, Im impossible by any means. That distance of 1,400 kilometers had been covered by Alexander Game, by uh, by um, Henry Worsley, and even Borgi Ausland, who, used, who, who's got, who did the red line right there. He... Oh. He actually, he used a, a small kite for part of the journey, but most of the journey he actually did not and covered more than what Colin did without uh, without a wind, wind support. So mine will be purely without wind support. And that distance that I'm covering has never been covered before without wind. Okay, so let me ask you this. Why not this area here? It looks like nobody's been over here. There have been adventurers. This this map doesn't show the a dog crossing. So there was one team that did a dog crossing from literally the, the furthest you can go. So that's the far east the eastern tip to the top, like the western kind of um, peninsula tip way. Yeah, like over east. here, down to this way? Boom. It's even even doing what I'm doing is borderline. I mean, many explorers consider it impossible to do it because you don't, you also can't just do, you don't have all the time in the world. You have to do it before Antarctic winter. Antarctic wind, Antarctic summer is unforgiving and savage. It's like, you know, minus 40 degrees, hurricane force winds. Antarctic winter is 24 hours darkness. You're talking minus 70, minus 80 degrees. It's so cold, the fuel that a fuel that I use to boil snow, it freezes. So no human beings even attempted a winter expedition in Antarctica. That's, as of right now, logistically not even possible, barring some technological advances. 
So what I'm doing is I, I you, thought Antarctica was off limits for a lot of reasons. I mean, I thought it was it uh, is, it is not. Right There's now. misconceptions about that. Uh, I mean, theoretically, if I wanted to go anywhere in that eastern, like that vast expanse on the east, I could. There have been adventurers who've done things like that. It's just it's more about the like logistics of how to manage it. So I, I want to say this. I, I went to hire, try to hire a, a private pilot to see if I could traverse from the very north point of Antarctica all the way to the very south point of Antarctica. And I couldn't find a pilot that would do it. Obviously, they said you have to fly a certain amount, uh, a certain, I guess, distance high over certain parts because they have some kind of green a deal to where you're not allowed to emit any kind of CO2 emissions over a certain part of it um, or anything like that. Are you aware of that? So the, it is highly regulated because of the Antarctic Treaty. And so when, when we go as adventurers, there's one company called Antarctic Logistics and Expeditions, ALE. They're the ones who manage logistics and permits for all adventurers. So essentially, I go through them and they get the permits. They are also going to be flying me to the pickup point and the drop-off point, things like that. So they're the ones who organize. They have a base that's kind of near the tip of that green line um, there called Union Glacier. I'll be flying from Chile. That's where I flew in last time as well. I'll be flying from uh, Punta Arenas in Chile to that point called Union Glacier in Antarctica. And then right from Union Glacier, uh, around there, yeah. From there, I'll be flying to... Um, uh, so you, start point are you pretty confident on this expedition i mean i mean it seems like there's there has to be a lot of you're going to be facing a lot of uh, unknown factors and elements i mean i mean are you are you yeah. kind of nervous i mean we've all heard the stories of Adam bird uh you know he says he claimed to see uh you know a crystal city i mean there's all kinds of conspiracy theories floating yeah, around there are. This, you know, antarctica i mean are you prepared to see something you never thought you'd see in your wildest imagination. I mean, I mean, a lot of the, a lot of the are conspiracy theories are like, I mean, cause I remember, I, I can't remember what it was, but I remember seeing one video where one guy did this whole conspiracy theory about Antarctica. And I'd actually been to the exact point he was talking about. And I was like, there's nothing like that, you know? So, uh, so it, it's to a certain degree, some of it is exaggerated. I've been to the, the, the point where I was at last, last, um, you know, where the red line kind of curves, uh, yes. okay. arrow. Oh, going back to, um, that other picture but anyway like where i was like two years ago so i'm not so much worried about sort of seeing the like things like that i've, I've experienced i know my friends have been up the two glaciers i will be yeah i was up there last time i was there i was i went up that glacier at the bottom of that curve there to the top uh right here. Like, like around yeah up there and i was evacuated just kind of at the yep yeah, around there so you've made it you've been here before I've been there and I've been also to Union Glacier and then flown from Union Glacier to that point as well. Just looking And you're going to cross all this on foot. How steep all are this. these how steep are these mountains? How high so are the, 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 the South Pole is at 9500 feet. So you're actually the, the ice shelf which are the 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 top thing there that's kind of not what's so the polar plateau and and at the bottom here where you see McMurdo you can see the edge of the mountains that that's called the ice shelf. The two ice shelves are flat. But they, uh, I will have to move up a glacier to go onto what's called a polar plateau and then down the other side back onto the flat ice shelf. And those, I mean, they're not so steep that you're, you're sort of climbing, but it's, it's work because you're dragging a 400, you're, you know, at that point it'll be a little bit lighter, but dragging a very heavy sled up that glacier. So I'll be coming up the other side, kind of uh, where the top of that red line is kind of uh, coming right here. up Run here. Oh, no, on the other side of the, like, so go um, kind of further up northwest there to like where the the how do i like go like uh, further oh, up here. up up uh there on that side yep i'll be coming up there exactly that's where i'll come because i'll be starting on that on that coastline and coming up the glacier there I'll, oh, there's a glacier called the support force glacier coming up to the south pole so it's not as so those those glaciers are the two most dangerous portions of the trip because of crevasse danger crevasses are the most horrifying thing to me they're the scariest part but i do have data from a friend one of my friends is one of only three human beings has been up who's been on the two glaciers that i will be on you have to go up the glacier to come onto the plateau and then down another one called the reedy to go onto the ice shelf and so those two glaciers will be crevassed 
And thankfully, you know, again, I have data from my friend to mitigate risks. You can obviously never eliminate it. But polar travel is not as dangerous as, let's say, Alex Honhol's free solo. You guys seen that? No. Have you, John? No, I haven't. No. It's a very cool documentary where he free soloed up El Cap. Or even like the closest thing it gets compared to often is mountaineering, right? right? Like climbing Everest, things like that. People compare it to that all the time. But unlike mountaineering, it's not as dangerous. I mean, I've been on big mountains. Like I was on Denali to a year ago and, you know, you're at 16,000 feet on a ridgeline so thin and a thousand foot drop on each side of you, right? Like right on that thin ridgeline. And so your mind is forced into being kind of very present. You can't be thinking about oh. things. It's right there because of each step of the, of the fall. So there's danger. There's Every day when you're climbing up a mountain is dynamic. As you go up and down the mountain, the terrain changes, the the nature of the climb changes, the views change. So it's a little bit more mentally engaging and more dynamic. But obviously, there's a risk of falling because you're going up a mountain. In polar travel, it's not nearly as dangerous, but it is far more suffering, like infinitely more suffering. Uh, out of all the things I've done, I've been in the military, I've run ultra marathons, I have, uh, I've, you know, I've, I've been to war, I have um, been mountain climbing, nothing compares, at least in terms of voluntary suffering, to polar travel, because you are just dragging this heavy sled in flat white nothingness. So barring like two sections of Antarctica where I'll see mountains, almost all of the journey, every day you look out, there's no stimuli, every day is the exact same thing. It's just flat, empty white nothingness and that is a mind fuck so you said, so you, you said you earlier are, you'd, go, go, ahead. go ahead you know no go ahead no, you're, it's you're your show you go first you're an adrenaline junkie you are it, it's it's it's, well, it's kind of funny you say that because i actually you don't the nature of polar travel you're actually not getting much adrenaline it's very slow paced you're moving fairly slowly with a like mind-numbingly slowly it's not a sexy sport to watch like if you watch backcountry skiing where they're you know heli skiing down a mountain that shit's badass right this one is just basically some guy plodding along very 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 slowly so it's not so much the adrenaline as it is the what i get what like what draws me to it i guess coming to that question of the why Personally, for me, that level of suffering that you experience, the mind-numbing monotony, the stillness, the solitude, I mean, geographically, portions of this journey, I will be the most isolated life form, not even human being, the most isolated life form on the entire planet. So to me, that is a very spiritual journey to connect to what I would call, what everybody has their own version of this, but what I would call God, connecting to universe, connecting to the self, connecting to the human soul, like in that silence, in that suffering. And with, when you experience the depth of that suffering and solitude, you have to tap into something in the human soul to transcend that suffering. You know, Nino, you've trained hard. You know how it is when you suffer. You have to find something within to push through that suffering, right? And that is a draw for me on a personal and spiritual level. And then on a sort of... A, the, like to me, every big goal should should have a selfish and a selfless reason. So the selfish reason for me is kind of, I would call enlightenment. It's tapping my own inner Buddhahood, awakening that divinity that every human being has within that you can only find in the depths of solitude and suffering. And selflessly, it's to bring the wisdom back from that edge and share it with others who are suffering because everybody suffers, but I get to play so far out on the edge, like at a very extreme edge that I get to then open doors into the human soul that aren't otherwise open very often. And so the treasures that you unearth on those on the other side of those doors, to me, it's a responsibility. And I mean that genuinely, like that's a core part of my identity. When I was in Iraq, my vehicle drove over an active IED that didn't explode just for some reason. My wow. friends drove over an active IED. He is, his exploded. He was killed. That shit lives with me. So to me, I believe I have a debt I owe for this life. And I pay off that debt by exploring the edges and bringing the wisdom back from the edge to help others navigate their own version of their own polar storms and suffering and just the human experience that we all endure. Man, you know, looking at this from uh, my perspective, and I'm one of those conspiracy theorists that I guess that, you know, everybody talks about, but, you know, a lot of the stuff that I've researched over the years, such as Admiral Byrd's journals and, and such, if they can be trusted, uh, also some of the treaties that really don't, to me, they don't really allow for a complete south to north travel across Antarctica. And I know that I know I realize why you're not doing it because obviously you're talking about trying to who knows how long that's going to take you, how much food you're going to have to carry, and how much non supported travel you're going to mm -hmm. have there. Uh, but you said you're traversing this with your own form of uh, navigation. 
Mm -hmm. How, if the South Pole is in fact a magnetic South Pole, how is that even possible uh, with with basic instruments? Yeah, good question. So this is so where I'll be going is actually not the magnetic South Pole. That's a different spot. This is the geographic South Pole. But either way, the compasses, the way they're designed, do I mean the technology is unreal compared to what like Amundsen had 110 years ago. So with the compass and GPS, essentially, so GPS will have will have waypoints data. And then you set the waypoint like when I mean, when you're in a whiteout, you're skiing and I, you can't see 10 feet in front of you. So it's blank, white nothingness the whole time. You just stare at a compass that's attached to a harness in front of you. You set a bearing on the compass and for 10 to 12 hours a day, you're just locked into that bearing and making sure you're skiing in line with that. And that's how I'll be navigating is with a GPS and a compass and sitting on a compass harness to get to that geographic South Pole. And the geographic South Pole is the only portion of the journey where you'll see some degree of uh, human civilization because there's a big research station at the South Pole, ALE, Antarctic Logistics and Expeditions that I mentioned. They also have their own base at the South Pole. Uh, and so that's where I'll kind of pass a, a, a small degree of human civilization before I keep moving and I won't stop at the South Pole at all because that's a mentally a very easy place to stop and you know want to get comfortable go in for a hot shower but uh you, you don't want to do that obviously that's your halfway point so I'll just keep moving from there so so where is magnetic South Pole from there it it's uh I think I can't remember off the top of my head but I think if you google it I think it's to the further east of the actual geographic South Pole Interesting. So, so as far as you know, and and I'm just asking you this since you you seems like you've done tons of research on all the Very much. different traveling that's gone across there. As far as you know, nobody's traversed from the north all the way to the south the south end of it. I guess it would still be considered north if you look yeah. at the Earth as yeah. a globe. But has anybody traversed directly, like let's say straight from? Yeah. Actually, if you go back to that map of the Eric Phillips map, Eric Phillips is the a polar mentor and friend of mine. I think it's on that first tab there. Um the that that first tab open. I think it's oh. still oh. Eric Phillips, right? Yep, yep. The yep, there you go. Antarctica solo map. If you go back to that one and then just go to the image if uh yep, so you'll see you'll see the yellow line there as well as the light blue line. The yellow line is a very accomplished polar explorer named Rune Gildness. He, as you can see, kind of went from one tip to the, like a Northern tip, but to the South and then further back North to the bottom of McMurdo. He, that, that, and then the light blue line is from Mike Horn. They've pulled off some of the longest crossings. They used a kite for a big portion of the journey, which allowed them to do it in, in the, cause you're at, with a kite, you can cover sometimes hundred plus kilometers a day. Without a kite, that's just not not. What's a, a, I'm thinking about a kite a kid flies. What, what's a kite? It's like a you know like um a, a kite surfing. I mean it's 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 a huge. If you Google oh polar gotcha. height, I think just Google like polar um skiing kite kind of thing, and I think you should see it. Uh, you should see what kind of what I'm referring to polar skiing kite something like that. Uh, so is this is this oriented north south? This map here, so we have the south is at the bottom, north at the top, or is that oriented differently? It's kind of because the geographic South Pole is so yeah here you can see like uh images it, it kind of like that picture snow kite yeah so they'll have like a large kite pulling them along with wind exactly kind of like these guys yep kite skiing there you wow. go wow and you just well, that's are you you're not going to be using that. I will not be using the a uh, kite so this is what's never been done is to actually cross without a a kite. Mm -hmm. Pure so, man, man hauling is just fucking pure suffering, man. It's like a yeah, I, I can imagine. <laughs> yeah, so you're will, you're you're totally willing to lose your life. You know, so coming back to the dangers, like it's not nearly as dangerous as mountaineering because again, you're not falling. The it's it's much more suffering, and that's the draw for me. I mean, again, I'm not going to say it's not dangerous, but it is not nearly as dangerous as people think as it gets compared to. It's not like free soloing. It's not like um mountain even mountain climbing. I have to actually well I'll be checking in with ALE every day from uh, when I come to my tent, just calling them through the sat phone, letting them know, hey, you know, I covered 15 miles today. Uh, I'm doing good. Everything is golden. I'll have a live tracker with me. So the two most dangerous portions are the like in terms of objective danger are the glaciers because of the crevasses. Now of course on the polar plateau Things can happen that are dangerous, like the storms are horrific. If I lose a tent, 
I'm fucked. But that's kind of like on me to make sure I don't let that happen. That's why I train. That's why I've been on a series of expeditions before. But the storms are, I mean, you're talking like hurricane force winds, minus 40 degrees. So objectively, the, the, the weather is obviously extremely unforgiving, gnarly, cold. You can't get, but in modern times, there has been not a single polar adventurer has been killed on a polar expedition. This is modern times, to be clear. Like back in the golden age of exploration, when people were going there for the first time ever, yes, there were a lot of deaths. Uh, the British explorer, Scott, he died after reaching the South Pole. He was the second team to reach after Roald Amundsen. All him and his entire team died on the way back. But again, back then they didn't have planes. They didn't have sat phones, right? Different world. So right. to, it's not as dangerous as people think it, it to be very clear. Uh, again, not to say it's not dangerous, but it is more just the, the draw for me is the, is the struggle, the hardship rather than the danger. I have friends who okay. climb both day two and Everest and done South pole trips and both, and all of them will say like far more suffering, but not as dangerous. So, so on that, I, I got one question real quick while we're sure. on this, on this thing. On, so this Antarctic, I'm looking at this Antarctic map. And so, mm -hmm. On what we would call our right side, if you're looking at the map, um, you have places like Princess Elizabeth Land, Kaiser Wilhelm Land, Queen Mary Land. Um, all of these places along there are, as an explorer, are you allowed to go to these places? Because to me, in order to, I guess, prove that Antarctica is exactly how it's mapped, you would have to tra traverse from... Mm -hmm. um it, through that area through there is that possible as a as just me like let's say one day i decide i want to go to kaiser wilhelm land yeah is that going to be possible it's it's quite a logistical challenge but it is possible so you just have to make find a way to make that happen it'll be expensive as all hell uh even my journey because of where i'm going is very very expensive it's like it's seven hundred fifty thousand dollars. but there is a team that has gone from the far west uh polar uh the, the tip on that peninsula called the mm -hmm. Larsen Ice Shelf to like towards that Princess Elizabeth and Wilhelm Land. There's a team that's done a 220 day dog crossing. Nowadays, dogs are no longer allowed for in Antarctica, but back when they were, they did a full, like the longest way you can possibly cross Antarctica with dogs. And they've been- What about if I just flew to those places though, without crossing Antarctica? Like, let's say I just want to fly to Princess Elizabeth Land or have a plane you could, drop me off. You could, I mean, like it. it's technically, I don't know if- you could do that if you find a pilot to take you and all that, but it's um, but when you do enter Antarctica, like there has been one adventurer who went and just sort of didn't announce his trip, didn't get permits or anything, and he did it. He got out there okay, but generally speaking, they like they the kind of you you want you you'd have to get permits. So ALE kind of helps guide that, but you could theoretically, if you found a way, like you could, yeah, you could land there. Uh, and uh, it, there is quite like that's the biggest challenge with all these places. It's not sort of you're not allowed to. It's just getting there because of the permits and things like that and the flights, the cost, you know, all of those factors to go. Like I, I, even if you look at the, the Dome Fuji on that map, there's one adventurer who's gone towards that northeast corner there and done some done some pretty wild stuff in that corner. And it's again, it's so you can go like I could theoretically go all those places. It's just can you afford it? Can you logistically manage it? And how do you safely do it kind of thing? So let me ask you this. You know, you accomplished this, which we assume you're going to accomplish. Thank you. Uh, you you realize you're going to accomplish a lot of things. You're also destroying, and which I've had these people on my show before. I've always given them a platform to talk. And believe me, this is a huge debate right now. Mm -hmm. What do you have to say to the people, the flat earthers out there? <laughs> see that, <laughs> that Antarctica goes around the, the, the world. It's like an ice shelf. It's an ice wall. What, what do you have to say to these people that, that will tell you, Ah, he's full of it. The earth, the earth is flat. He's not really going to Antarctica. What do you have to even say to those type of people? I mean, people are going to believe what they believe. And no matter what I say, you're not going to convince some of them otherwise. But like funny story about the flat earthers. When I was in Antarctica last time, I met a friend of mine, a now friend who drives ice trucks in the Antarctica. And he has this sick video on YouTube. I can't remember what it is. Like, I'll try to find it and send it to you all later. But he actually has a video of, an, of a crane on it on on like a because there's, there's the ice shelves, you know, are like look like a like the world is dropping off. A boat comes onto a crane, picks up his ice truck and puts it on, on the boat. And his video went viral. And I'm like, why did it go viral? And it turns out the flat earthers were using that video to justify that the earth just drops off. 
but that's just an ice shelf on the edge of Antarctica, which there are tons of edge of ice shelves. So I've been to Antarctica. I know many Antarctic adventurers who are friends of mine. It's just not remotely true. Uh, and so, you know. So, I mean, so I, speaking for the flat earthers here, okay. Please. Because <laughs> because th- this is, I'm one of these guys, right? And I and I am one of those people that I'm not Are you a flat earther, John? Well, well, I am definitely a geocentric, I uh, have a geocentric idea. I am to the point to where I don't know exactly how the earth is shaped. But I can say this, like from my experience in trying to figure out a way to prove to myself that Antarctica um, is exactly how it's mapped. I've been unable to do it even for a million dollar price tag. I couldn't find a, not that I'm a millionaire, but I could raise the money to do it um, probably in a few days. If I was genuinely going to be able to travel what I would be satisfied with is completely across Antarctica. It was impossible for me to make that happen. Impossible for me to get the permits, impossible for me to get the pilot and so from my perspective as a person that I need to see things for myself, I can't really just 100% rule anything out. I'm not satisfied with um, the means that is possible for me to be able to see if that's even true. And that's one thing I can reach out. Now, there's a lot of flat earthers that are shills and they're, uh, there's a psych- psychological operation. Flat Earth Society is a, to me, I believe that Flat Earth Society is a shill operation to make flat earthers look stupid. But at one time, you got to remember, everybody believed in the flat earth. In fact, there are maps that show that this is the way because the navigation is exactly the same, whether you're on a flat earth, you're on a globe. It all it all is um, north is in the center and you you go around like it's not like you're going off the edge or anything like that, because uh, that's not the way it works. But I know a lot of people have misconceptions about what people believe, but um to me, I think that unless you can unless you can take a ship and go all the way around the coast, which I know that this is years and years long, all the so way around. Take it, a ship and go all around here. Just go completely all the way around it. Yeah, unless you can do go all the way around it. Um, I to me, it's hard to prove it. Or if you can fly, let's say from yeah, South I mean, America. He's, he's... So they actually do have bases all around. Tiny little, like every a bunch of countries have little bases all around Antarctica. So there are actually human presence on almost every edge of uh, Antarctica. I mean, large gaps between, but, uh, but, and there, there has been, uh, like I said, there's been one adventure who's crossed from East to Northwest East. There's another, there's a couple of who've crossed entirely from North to South and way back in the golden age of exploration, there has been a lot of mapping done of some of the more remote regions uh, in the early 1900s. And today there are bases because as you can see from the map you're currently showing, you know, that Northwest plateau, the uh, sort of uh, peninsula is closest to Chile, but on the other side, you're close to New Zealand. So New, Ze- so New Zealand has a base at the bottom there called McMurdo. Right. And that's, and that's what I, that's out. what, that's what a pilot actually offered me is from South America to New Zealand. And to me, that doesn't cut it for me. Like I would need to be from South America to go 100 120 degree mark straight all the way through to get to that point in order for me to kind of believe that and that would ha- and I'd have to see the GPS the entire time I'm doing so it. So no turns, you'd have to go straight across. Straight across, like straight straight across it because I mean there are old maps as well and and th- this see that's the problem it's like I have to rely on somebody else's word because I can't even get a flight for a million dollars across it. So how would I or any normal person that's not um, you know, kind of isolated in these certain parts, be able to prove that you that's actually even could. Possible. It's just it's just very expensive. Like I'm like one of my friends holds the Guinness World Record for the uh, for circumnavigating the globe, and she actually flew. She with the team flew over the like I, I forget. I think it was like over the North Pole and the South Pole. Like circumnavigated the entire globe. Uh, what was, what was the name of that team? Yannicka uh, Wilson. Her 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 name is Yannicka. Uh, how do J A N N I C K E. Yannicka Mickelson, and then um, I can pull up on. Can you spell with a Y or with J? J, yeah. She traversed. Uh, a J A N N I C K E. Yeah, Wilson. Yannicka Mickelson. Mickelson. That's her. Yeah, she she circumnavigated the globe with the small team. Um, uh, she's a friend of mine. 
Do you, does it have like the map, the path she traveled? I mean, you said she went through the North Pole and then yeah, flew circle. over Antarctica. Had some wild stories from that. Uh, uh, I'm sure it's somewhere. I'm not. I don't know all the details, but so you I mean again, a lot of the things are possible. They're just logistically quite a challenge and extremely expensive to do. Um, even Antarctica, it's very. It's like I can go wherever I want. This is some other Danish explorer, yeah, but um, but a lot of the I stuff. Gone. Are you able to pull yeah, it up? Yeah, yeah. I'm gonna try to pull it up. I'm gonna, I'm looking for it. Uh Janica. I'm trying to look at the map. If I can find it, it's really it's um I'm looking here. Okay, I see a map and I think this is no, that's the longest walk. I, I don't know. I'm having trouble finding the map of it, but I'm sure it's there. Isn't this it right here? Is that it? Is that it? Uh, no, that's I, a from, that's an old Danish explorer. It looks like. So let me, let me ask you this. Oh yeah. Actually, um, you know, when I was boxing, I got a lot of adrenaline. I was yeah. I lived on adrenaline. Okay, it was just it was always fight or flight mode. I was always it was just always in that mode. And then once I retired, you know, there's a lot of fighters that retire from boxing or UFC or whatever, and they never get that adrenaline rush back. They always just it's kind of like life loses its shine because you need that that a constant fight or flight in your bloodstream. You need that constant adrenaline in your bloodstream. And that's why a lot of them go to drugs, cocaine, heroin, whatever. Like mm -hmm. feel that need, but it never really feels the need. Mm -hmm. I've been able to stay sober and I'm living a complete life, but I really had to accept, you know, life without that stimulation anymore. And I got to say, life is a lot more peaceful because I have a lot of wisdom in which I've learned through the years of mm. boxing. Mm. Uh, it kind of taught my soul some very valuable lessons. But what when this is over for you, when it's done, are you going to try to do something to top this? Or are you finally going to say, I did it. My soul's content. Now I can rest. What's next for you after yeah, this? Let's accomplish this. What's next? Great you know, uh, I get where you're coming from. There is a tremendous amplification and intensity of life. The volume gets dialed up massively on expedition. So when I come back after every expedition, it's almost like I come back from war. There's kind of a low that hits, you know? So, but I think for me, the part of like the joy in life is the ups and downs, is the roller coaster, because you can't have a summit without a valley. You can't have a high without a low, you know? So I value the low as much as I value the high. But as far as like what's next, uh, in terms of adventures, I do know, for example, one, I want to get back into cave diving. It's a little bit more. Um... Damn, you're going from <laughs> one to the next. That's horrible. <laughs> That's horrible. I watch that stuff on YouTube. Mm -hmm. It's more, it's, it's sort of. Um, it's cave not diving, physically... like in the water, going to underwater yeah. cave. I've done some cave diving before, and it's very. You, it, why don't you just play Russian roulette? <laughs> <laughs> it's not. Again, it's you can do a dangerous thing, but do it in a safe way. Like I, I do things that push the edge, but I am very safe in how I do them because I train relentlessly. But more importantly than also adventures, like I want to focus. I just got married. You know, I've been married now three months, so I want to spend some time with. Like the first year of my marriage. I'm gone for six months because I'm going to Iceland next week for a month long solo expedition. And then in August, I'm going to Greenland for a month long crossing of Greenland again. Uh, I've crossed. Did she know what she signed up for before you got married? Or so when we, on, her no, no. <laughs> the, on our second date, we had a long talk about me going to Antarctica, you know, so she knew before we started because we've only been dating about eight, nine months. We got married six months in. Um, so we, you know, she knew that this has kind of been on my kind of my life's goal for, or at least directly for four years. But in many ways, I think it's a culmination of decades of pushing the line and playing on the edges, you know? So I don't think like, I don't know where it'll take me in terms of adventures, but I do know I want to focus a little bit more on like time with my wife, spending, staying some staying put a little bit on the marriage and also building the brand a little bit more, focusing on sharing the lessons I learned to help other people have their own versions of their Antarctic crossings, whatever that may be, you know, we're going to film a documentary around it. So uh, releasing the documentary, sharing a book around is, is it. That going to be a, is, so is this documentary, is it going to be on Netflix? Are you going to try to put it on Netflix and something like that? Yeah, I mean, there's some great something. documentaries. It'll be something like that, exactly. Like a Netflix will go, you know, where... Um, so you are going to document your whole... You're going to bring a GoPro and record all yeah. of it. And they filmed a series of... They came and filmed me in the Arctic. They filmed me in Iceland. They filmed me 
in Arizona. They filmed me in Alaska when I was just there. They also filmed me in Mexico when I, I did a 10 day darkness retreat where you just sit in a dark room for 10, 10 days, uh, like completely dark, 10 days, 24 hours a, a day in complete darkness. They came and filmed me coming out of the darkness as part of it. I did that as training wow. for the, for mastering, you know, internal stillness of mind and mastering solitude. Uh, so I did that darkness retreat last or two years ago now, a year and a half ago as well. And so they, they filmed a series of footage we've accumulated from all my trainings. And then Antarctica is obviously the culmination. Yeah. Cause the white rooms will make you go crazy too. From what I understand, I was watching this, um, show where they put people in these white rooms and eventually they were almost losing their mind because there's li literally no stimulation. So you, you'll kind of have that going on in Antarctica, Antarctica huh? exactly. Like, like they say from, I've heard from polar adventure friends, when you come back from a really long trip in Antarctica, it takes a few weeks for your eyes just to readjust to seeing stimuli again. So you're kind of like, I wouldn't say blind, but semi <laughs> blind. Yeah. Uh, I mean, I'll be a wreck when I come back, you know, my, my wife is prepared. I'll be in physically in bad way, mentally a little weird. I'm actually taking, you ever seen the movie Castaway, where Tom Hanks yeah. talks to his little Wilson? Yeah. I'm taking my own little Wilson with me. I have a little <laughs> stuffed pillow. That'll be my Wilson that I'll be talking to for the 110 days out there. <laughs> yeah. You must do CrossFit or something, man. I mean, what do you do? What do you do to stay in shape for this? Because how, what, what's the weight of the food you're carrying? So the, the food is the heaviest thing in the sled. I'll be eating about 6,600 calories a day uh, and burning eight to 10,000. So even from day one, I'm at a caloric deficit. So one of the things I'm actually doing is polar exploration is a very unique beast to trace, train for because you have to train endurance I'll be dragging the sled for 10 to 12 hours a day. You have to train strength to be as strong wow. as you need to, to drag that sled. And you have to do it all while you're fat. So I'm actually consciously, constantly trying to get fat. So I have weight to lose because like every expedition I've gone on, especially the longer ones, you lose weight out there. So I'm, I'm like trying to get fat to, <laughs> to make sure I have weight to lose, but I'll be eating about 6,600 calories. And I've managed to get 6,600 calories to weigh 1060 grams so just over one kilo per day tape per day bag of food and so you add that all up that's you know that's 110 120 kilos plus fuel is the second heaviest thing fuel because you have fuel to boil snow for water that's the second heaviest and the rest of it i mean i'm literally wearing the same underwear base layer the entire 110 days so i'm so i'm so ruthless with weight cutting that you know that the, the, the tags on your shirt i've cut those tags off i've cut my toothbrush in half just anywhere, like the zippers on my tent. My tent is actually sitting right here. I have the zippers on my tent that I've cut the zip handles off to save more weight. So all well, you cut your finger off. I've cut my <laughs> finger off. Exactly. <laughs> save more weight. Exactly. <laughs> I was like, you don't have to carry around a pillow. Just tattoo a face on your hand, and you can also be your, <laughs> <laughs> your girlfriend too. <laughs> That's oh, the one man. sort of quote unquote luxury item that I'm taking. It's a very <laughs> small stuffed pillow. It's got a laughing Buddha. Rosie on it. and her five sisters, in your case, four sisters. I'm just blown away by this. You, do you feel like, what about the conspiracies out there that you, the, the, the unknown factors? Are you prepared for this? I mean, you got to equate that into the equation. You got to factor that in. What yeah. about, anything unknown i mean nobody's really i mean as far as i know that i was always under the impression that no antarctica has never really been explored so there i mean most of what where i have been where i'll be going a handful of people have actually been there so i know the one person who's been on both the glaciers he's actually like one of only and he led both trips he's one of only three human beings to have been on the glacier there's only a very small portion of the journey that i'll be on that no human being has ever set foot on uh, but it's kind of connecting certain routes that I'll be stepping on because nobody's done a full crossing, but people have done portions of the route. And I'm kind of, you know, putting those all those together to do a full crossing. So there'll only be portions of the journey that no one's ever set foot on. But otherwise, like it, a lot of it has been covered by, I mean, again, less than a handful of people. And, and, but you're, I know pulling, and you're pulling a, how much is this sled, this sled weigh? At the higher end, highest end, I'm estimating about 400 pounds. You're pulling a 400 pound sled through snow and ice. It's mm -hmm. 400 pounds. Mm -hmm. So I was just in Alaska training and I would go out with 400 pound sleds. And I actually got to the point I was dragging 560 pounds just because I want to drag even heavier, right? Suffer harder well, training. <laughs> wow. 
Wow. And it is, it is, I mean, it's just, there's no other way to put it. It's fucking work, but you, it's, it's a, it's beyond the physicality of it. It's mentally because you're moving so slow. So there's this kind of mind numbing monotony, you know, unlike, let's say when I was ultra running, yeah, I may be doing long distances, but you're kind of moving You're You're seeing new things as you move, right? You're, you're running. So you're moving a little faster with when you're pulling a 500 pound, 400, 560 pound sled, you're moving so slow. So it's the, it's the mental challenge of that, that is demanding but also for me a big part of the draw like can you mentally endure this you know and that it was i mean i the reason i and as as you guys know right you got to suffer harder in training so i dragged a very a very heavy like 560 pounds as high as i got to 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 get a feel so because the brain thinks in references so when i now have a 400 pound sled it comparatively feels even lighter than what i've trained with even when i go to but, iceland you're not month, factoring in blizzards are you I mean, are you a blizzard uh I've been I mean, in I've been in Antarctic storms. I've been in Arctic storms. So I'm familiar with them. And uh, like anything, you know, I've uh, you have to train to be the eye of the storm in this in in this case a very literal storm, but even a figurative storm. You know, to train to stay still in the face of that. So I've been in like last year I was in the Arctic, and this massive 60 mile an hour winds were hitting, and the direction changed. So usually when you set up your tent, it com you set up your tent so the wind's going from the back to the front. It's called a tunnel tent. So it's designed to kind of have the wind go over you. But in Antarctica, usually the wind stays consistent. In the Arctic, it moved. So it moved to the side of my tent. And was I was literally sitting inside my tent with my hands up like this, holding the uh, the, the side of the tent because the wind was just pushing me down. You know, it was just hammering me. It's 59, 60 mile an hour wind. So I've been in the storms before. So I'm, 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 I've, I've mentally trained myself to be able to stay calm in the face of them. And I will be skiing in those blizzards. As I mentioned, when you're in a whiteout, you know, like you can't see shit, but you're just staring at the compass in front of you and just following that to stay in doing that for again, 10 to 12 plus hours a day. It's a, it's like if someone invites you on a ski trip, you're like, whatever <laughs> <laughs> all my friends who 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 actually do like alpine skiing and snowboarding they think cross-country skiing is the stupidest shit in the world they're like why would i, I walk I, to my feet <laughs> i mean it's, teach their own, it's okay if you agree <laughs> teach their own dude i mean you're doing what you want to do i just man the whole 500 pound sled thing i mean just factoring in all this all the elements i just Man, I for 10, 10 hours with a five hundred pound sled. Yeah. So it'll be in Antarctica. It'll a be day. four hundred at the highest end. And you know, every day you every day you eat food and use fuel. It's getting lighter. So the first portion of the journey, about I think twenty to twenty five days, will be pure flat. Mm -hmm. Hopefully not that soft snow, but harder snow. But if you get you get what you get, right? Every season, Antarctica conditions are Antarctica is just savage. It is what it is. Now at the same time, there's a little bit of luck element. Like if I get soft, like horrifically soft snow. That's going to be brutal. When I was in Antarctica last time, the sled wasn't nearly as heavy, but we got some soft snow. And even 18 days worth of food in soft snow, man, it is work. It is hard work. But pulling that for 25 days in flat terrain, so the sled will be a little bit lighter by the time I have to start climbing. Then I climb the glacier, this glacier called a support force, go uphill at that point. And uh, I mean, that's again, that's why I train the way I train. You know, I've been in Alaska. When I'm here in Arizona where I live, I drag tires around my local parks. So I have these very heavy truck tires. It's quite a sight, as you can imagine. But uh, I just drag these tires around the parks out here. That's my training. And and, and how much of the day is light and dark? Like a little... in in Antarctica, when I go, it'll be twenty four hours daylight, so no no darkness at all. That's actually one of the things I miss the most because I love sunrets, sunrises, and sunsets. So it just also makes you appreciate. Like one of the other reasons why I do this is which is not possible with a flat Earth. No, <laughs> there you go. <laughs> but it does. It does. Well, it depends. It does. I mean, I think actually it should. It, like there, you said, you're going during the winter time, right? Though that would be the closest that the sun would be to the ice wall, pretty much all the time, right? If it was an yeah. ice wall, if it was, yeah. So. Yeah, in winter it's. You're, so you're a flat earther, John. You you are. A flat I, I'm. I'm. I am a person who believes that, that this earth is not exactly what we've been said i i uh, don't I'm, like to say, i don't like to use the term flat earther because i don't know 100 exactly what we're living on or how it's how it's made i just feel like there's so many uh things that are hidden and and so many obstacles to me being able to figure it out myself with my own eyes that 
it's I, I'm not a hundred percent on board with uh, the whole story, man. I I know well, I'm I'm with you on a that. flat Earth. That, yeah, yeah. So, I'm with you on that. I I'm the same. I mean, I I kind of feel there's a, you know, there is some kind of firmament, but I do believe in outer space. I I don't know. There's so I have I, look. I have just as many well, questions as anybody well. else. <laughs> You know, yeah, um, <laughs> but, but, but actually this is working people. Do you, are you taking donations? Are you? Yeah, like, no, I would appreciate any support. We've had a crowdfunding campaign going to fund this. As I mentioned, it costs seven or $50,000. Uh, part of this is for the flights. Part of it is because normal Antarctic season for adventurers is 85 days. They're extending it just for me, which means you have a skeleton crew at Union Glacier, a pilot, doctors, all these factors that adds up to a lot. So we, our crowdfunding campaign has so far raised $312,000. Uh, it's at greatsoulcrossing.com. So great, G-R-E-A-T, soul, S-O-U-L, and crossing, greatsoulcrossing.com. There's a crowdfunding campaign. And uh, in addition to like different donation tiers, I also give away different tools, like the mindset tools I've developed over decades of playing on the edges on how to cultivate this kind of resilience and ability to move through hard challenges for different donation tiers. So we're giving that away. And I'm not making a dollar off this, to be clear, like not a single dollar I am pocketing. It all goes to ALE to fund the expedition. Uh, so it's all towards that. Any support is obviously really much appreciated. And it will, because as I'll, I mentioned- I'll, I'll donate, definitely. You, I feel like you're going to need to, you're going to wear the same underwear, right? Yeah. <laughs> so I'm going to get you, I'm going to make sure you have some very warm, warm underwear because if, you, you, get frostbite, if you get frostbite down there, you're not gonna have a wife anymore. <laughs> You're gonna lose your wife. You're gonna really have your little friend on your hand. Yeah, yeah man. I appreciate it, brother. <laughs> Thank you. You got any other questions, I it, John? I th I just think it's amazing that you're willing to do this and put your life on the line to do it. Um, obviously you know, all jokes aside, like I believe the world is a little different than what we've been told, but either way, the fact that you're doing this, um, just shows that you are a glutton for adrenaline punishment, uh, all of those things just to be able to attain that inner peace And in which I understand that, you know, we all have to go through something hardcore sometimes to be able to understand what it really means to, to have peace or have, uh, joy. So I, I understand it, man. When I was a kid, I was a bad kid, but in my neighborhood, the only way to get adrenaline was running around knocking people's windows out or, you know, uh, yeah. banging on doors. And then, then now I do jujitsu grappling, a little bit of striking and stuff like that. Yeah. So I get it, man, but you're, you've taken it to a whole higher level than I've ever That's even dreamed crazy. of doing. So, <laughs> yeah. So let me ask you, this. are you up for some, uh, challenges maybe by like, I don't know, uh, I, I've always thought, has Lake Tahoe fully been uh, explored? Do you know that Jacques Cousteau went there and said the world was not ready for what he saw, right? Mm -hmm. um, the, the bottom of Lake Tahoe supposedly has, like, caverns and, like, it's so deep. And, like, there's things he saw that he wasn't able to relate to the public. And would you be willing to, like, and, and I could be wrong. The audience could check this out and be like, no, that's not true. That's what I've heard. Are you willing to yeah. ex take recommendations on your next challenge after Antarctica? <laughs> I'm definitely open to recommendations. Like, as I mentioned, yeah, cave diving. I thought of, the... of this because you said cave yeah, diving. Yeah, cave diving, exactly. So, I mean, that, Lake Tahoe, have yeah. you heard of this? I have not heard of the uh, this in Lake Tahoe. I know there's still, you know, a handful of un untouched por portions of the world, like cavers who go, who will find a new cavern and literally no human beings ever set foot in there. That's pretty wild to think about, you know? So What if caving... I help you raise money to set the record straight on Lake Tahoe? I'm open to exploration, brother. Absolutely. That's kind of what it was makes makes you come alive is not just exploring the external reality, but the internal reality as well. And so finding new new adventures. Uh, I'm definitely open to ideas. And we'll see what we'll see where the road takes me after Antarctica as well in terms of what specifically that I choose to embark upon. John, is anything else? Nothing else, man. I, I you know, I, I, I was planned on looking at this and seeing the same kind of expedition that uh colin o'grady did at first so i was like well this guy is gonna just be kind of going across a little part of it but you're really willing to make a long trip man and that's pretty awesome and i, I just want to say you, again i appreciate it nino for having me on and it was really nice to meet you actually and i hope that uh, i get to stay in contact with you man please would love to yeah thank you both no appreciate uh, appreciate you having uh, me. I'm, I'm excited for your journey so when does this begin november End October of this year, I'll be flying to Chile and then sometime in early November, 
flying to Union Glacier, and then from there to the start point. And then I'll be You'll there. You'll be for done when? End of February. So about four, just under four months. So you'll be spending the New Year in Antarctica. Spending Thanksgiving, Christmas, New Year's, uh, a lot of holidays, <laughs> Valentine's Day, <laughs> a lot of holidays out, out there alone in the ice. Wow. But, yeah. <laughs> um, actually, man, I commend you, bro. You're you're a you, true man. explorer, adventurer, man. Wow. So, folks, go to greatsoulcrossing.com. Give actually a donation for warm underwear because you can't afford to be frosted <laughs> down there. You can't and do not want to be. I don't mind losing <laughs> more things. <laughs> not down there. <laughs> <laughs> All right, actually, thank you so much, man. Thank, thank you for you, joining buddy. me, John. Thank you for co-hosting this. Uh, you guys, it. awesome. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.